Welcome to The Shanae Show, hosted by yours truly, Kavita Shanae. Today we have a fabulous guest for you in store. His name is David Cantor. He is a 25-year NFL sports agent. He's amassed $1.8 billion in player negotiations in those 25 years. And we're about to talk to him all things COVID-19 sports and how this is affecting the sports industry as a whole and actually how this is affecting the world. So stay tuned. I have known you for a while now. I actually met you at the Combine in 2014 and you are so accomplished. Just the things that you've done with players since then has been huge. You had your biggest contract to date in 2019. So it was five years, 105 million with Demarcus Lawrence to yep. the Cowboys, okay? And to think that you started out at a Shell station in law school where you met your first client ever. Can you tell us really quick that story? So yeah, I went to University of Miami School of Law and in my first year of law school, I got pulled over by a police officer for having a broken right tail light. And he said, there's a Shell gas station on 27th Avenue in Coconut Grove, right down the street. If you go get a 99 cent light bulb, you can probably fix the light bulb. It's just a burnt out bulb, or I can give you a $75 ticket. And I was like, well, I'm a pretty poor law student. I'll just go pay the 99 cents. So I'm trying to fix the light bulb in my car. It's in the back of the tail light. I'm bending over. I'm trying to figure it out. I have no idea what the hell I'm doing. And this green Range Rover pulls up, this guy gets out of it, and I immediately recognize him because back then, 1995, 96, nobody had green Range Rovers. And it was Lamar Thomas, the famous Miami Hurricane wide receiver, who had now just gotten, I think, traded to the Dolphins from Tampa Bay. So I kind of run up on him. I'm like, hey, man, I'm, my name's David Cantor. I go to the University of Miami School of Law. I'm a huge fan. I played wide receiver in college, blah, blah, blah what's the story of this agent business? And he's like, man, you talk too fast, chill out. Like, here's my page number, beat me. And then I think for like maybe three months, he ignored my pages. To make a long story short, Lamar became my first ever client in the NFL. What are your players doing right now to sharpen their sword and make sure that they're still fit and that they're still getting workouts in when they can't even see anyone and they're quarantining? Well, I think they're facing the same issues that every citizen in the United States of America and all over the world is facing, which is a constant day-to-day -day barrage of, of bad information, right? Every day you turn on the news, more people are dying, uh, less and less precautions are being taken specifically here in this country, you know, with planes flying over my head constantly, you're wondering, you know, when are we going to shut down air traffic? Because obviously that's one of the ways that the disease can be spread. And so, for us, it's just trying to get our guys stable with workouts, getting them information on what kind of training program they should be doing. We've spent a ton of time, more than I've ever done in my entire career, in getting guys equipment. So buying guys Peloton spin bikes, buying guys uh, weights, kettlebells, sandbags, jump ropes, just getting them as much ladders. I mean, I have Domata Peco right now is trying to get a special ladder set so he can do on-field drills, bags. You know, they can't go to the team's facilities right now. And so they can't do some of the things that they normally would be able to do. So for them, it's about stretching. It's about doing the things that they normally would do to get their bodies ready, whether it's going to a hot yoga class or going to Pilates. You can't do those, right? You can't go to them right now. You know, I know you work out. You can't go to your gym. You can't have your personal trainer at his house or wherever because of, you know, social distancing. You can't go to a big gym. You can't go to your NFL facility. So it's been that. And then for our rookies, we've got 13 guys getting ready to get drafted here in the next couple of weeks. I think it's 20 days or so away or less than 20 days away. And so we're trying to get them seen by teams. Some of our guys that weren't able to work out at the combine or some of our guys that weren't able to have pro days, which was every guy, because March 12th was when all of this went down. And so most of our guys had their pro days between the 20th and the 1st of April. So we've got digital uh, electronic timing. We've got videotape analysis. We've gotten some really unique things that I don't think a lot of other agencies are doing where we can actually send our video clips and our statistics to teams and then we can track what the teams actually have done. And so we can see how many times, like, for example, we have a player named Bradley and I, who's just a pretty highly rated prospect. he will be a top 100 draft pick, you know, probably second round, but maybe early third. We've actually sent some video stuff to teams and we can actually see how many times teams click on those videos to watch it. And we, we just found out the other day, one team had watched one specific situation and clip over 25 times in one day. So obviously that team has a significant amount of interest in him, whether or not we know whether they graded him as a first, a second, a third round pick, you don't really know until it all comes down. And then we've got a really unique draft situation where people are going to literally be doing the draft just like this on either Zoom or some other technology, you know, video conferencing technology, where you're going to have NFL teams making picks and agents and players talking on the phone. You're not going to have it 
or you're going to walk up and, you know, hug Roger Goodell or, or hug Troy Vincent and things like that. And so it's a very unique situation. You know, all I care about is trying to get the world back to normal. I don't know, and you probably know this as well as I do because we travel the world a lot and we love to travel. I don't know if there ever, there ever is going to be a new normal in the world. I think that air traffic and air travel are going to be completely changed. I think that the way people vacation is going to be completely changed. I think the precautions that we never normally took are going to now be really heavily implemented. I, I don't know that I could imagine myself going to a concert with 15,000 people out taking severe precautions on, on how to prevent from getting sick. You know, I just had an agent that I know very well and I've known for a long time, Buddy Baker, his mom and dad just passed away from COVID-19 and obviously it's tragic and horrible. They live here in Boynton Beach, you know, about 30 minutes away. And so you see what's going on in New York. It's constant barrage of terrible information and people are dying. This is serious. This is real. And unfortunately, our country hasn't done some of the extreme measures that are necessary to prevent the spread of this like they've done in other countries that are now starting to see that the decline in the in the rates of infection new infection and obviously death and i'm not a scientist but certainly i do listen to scientists and it seems like the powers that be have kind of ignored the scientists and are you know out there selling snake oil and things like that to people uh for whatever reason i don't i don't really understand how you can be a human being and watch innocent people die minute after minute, second after second, and read the stories of the EMTs and the doctors and the frontline nurses that are heroes, you know, that are, that are far overworked and underpaid, risking their own lives and their families' lives and separating and things like that and, and be a parent and be a human being just in the world, forget about the United States of America, and not want to do everything humanly possible to get rid of this as quickly as possible so that less people have to die less people have to suffer and we can get back to some sort of normalcy and so for me at least that's kind of the day-to-day -day. and so it, it's a lot of heady stuff it's very very difficult you know to, to say the very least and I, I wish our leadership in this country was doing more specifically here in the state of Florida uh, and obviously in the United States as a whole you're a guy that travels all the time right now you've been home since March 12th and this is not normal for you as it is not for many people around the globe how are you dealing with being at home with the kids and homeschooling and your wife and having to work from home? It's tough. I mean, you know, homeschooling, my goodness gracious, <laughs> that my wife is a saint as it relates to that, to say the least. She's a saint as it relates to everything else too, just having to put up with my life and, and the travel and my work and my lifestyle. But definitely dealing with three young kids, you know, we have an 11 and eight and a five-year-old boy. My five-year-old is definitely, you know, attention deficit disorder. He, you know, he goes on Zoom calls. I, I never had heard of Zoom, by the way, until COVID-19. We're on Zoom right now. I wish I had been an early adapter and, and owned some of the stock in this thing. The kids have actually been pretty cool. Like, there's been a couple days where you could tell that they want to do things. But we're, I mean, I know your house and I know my house. I mean, we're so lucky here. We're in South Florida. Uh, We've got thing going on over there because every day you guys are doing different themes. I mean, one day it's Hawaii. That's that Terry. That's my wife. I mean, she's she's been literally unbelievable from the standpoint of I had to do free agency. You know, we didn't. You know, that's a lot of people don't know that are watching this. We canceled everything in the world except for the NFL. Did not cancel anything. So we still had free agency. I mean, literally. Normally, my staff would come here from from Boston and New York and be here in my house. They'd live down the street and be working 20 hours a day. And so I would have like a five minute window where I could say, hey, team, let's pause. Let me look at my staff. Hey, Brian. Hey, Ness. Hey, Josh. Hey, you know, Drew, what do we want to do? How do we feel like this deal fit our guy? Get the guy on the phone, maybe video chat with the guy. Sometimes guys are here at my house. I mean, I did Sean Smith's deal when he was here at my house, Olivier Vernon's deal with him right here at my house in my kitchen with, with his financial advisor, Matt Cassano. On the first night of the tampering window, which I believe is a Monday uh, this year, players could, you can agree to a terms of a contract. As we were literally getting to 5 p.m., and the window starts at four or noon. I think it started at noon that day. Roger Goodell is issuing letters and statements on how we can conduct business. So the rules are changing instantly as we're actually in the middle of negotiations. Yeah, so Jamie Collins is, is a new client of ours. On the first day of the tampering window, I knew that Kyle Van Noy was going to be one of the hotter, if not the hottest linebackers on the market, a guy that can rush the pass or can drop off the coverage. And Detroit made it happen, and, and we signed a three-year, $30 million deal with $20 million over the first two. 
catch for a guy at, at his stage of his career, I think is a very big number. And it was a great win, but it was all done right here in my house. No hoopla, no toasting champagne glasses, no hugs, no high fives with staff. Those deals took a little bit longer. And so this football season, especially free agency, you've seen a lot of deals, bang, 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 bang deals, but there haven't been the huge numbers. And I think what happened is we all left Indianapolis at the combine on March 1st. And in 10 days and 14 days till we got to free agency, the entire world changed. The stock market collapsed, the economy collapsed, homelessness and, and joblessness claims are up, you know, 10, 10 tenfold, 15 fold, and the world's on fire right now. And so the owners who are obviously 32 of the richest people in the world and most powerful people in this country by far pulled back and said to their GMs and said to their, the people that run their books, hey, listen, let's chill out. Let's not spend 250 million. Maybe let's spend 200 million. Let's spend 170 million because I'm going to need that buffer for all the money I just lost in the market, meaning the owners, or I'm going to need that buffer in case we don't have a football season. It took me two weeks to get a deal done with the Cincinnati Bengals. Well, we have to wonder if fans are going to want to go to, you know, stadiums and arenas and if they're going to want to be out in public in that way because you just said it yourself. You don't know if you're going to want to go to a rock concert. So I don't know if I'm going to go to a football game. You know, I, I, I'm, I won't lie to you. Um, reading the stories of how this disease affects people, you know, I mean, listen, there's, there's way more important things than going to an NFL football game. I've been to 15, 20 a year, every year, my rest of my life, but my clients matter to me and supporting them matters to me and supporting their families matter to me. And right now it's all about safety. To me, it's all about being socially distant, you know, not having people come over, not, I haven't seen my mom. I haven't seen my dad. I haven't seen our neighbors. I haven't seen our friends. You know, we stay kind of isolated in our little bubble. We walk around the neighborhood. We're lucky that we have a big enough house with a pool and a backyard and basketball and tennis courts that we can keep the kids active. But some of my clients are in a one-bedroom, one-bath apartment by themselves, right? They're trapped. It's about keeping people's spirits up. And I, I'm hopeful that we can flatten the curve and then this thing will eventually, you know, reduce itself and, and people will start surviving. You'll have more survival rates and then obviously you'll have less and less less and less death but in this country i think that we are far far way away from anything re resembling where we were march 1st none of us really know an end date to this quarantine and when we can go out back in the world and feel safe again do you have an end date in sight that you're thinking about so for me david canner you know a sports agent and davy florida to predict when the world will return to normalcy i have no idea i have heard some good positive things from my friends in Europe, specifically Germany, and obviously, you know, their prime minister, what an incredible woman she is. Uh, and I think she was a biochemist, so she believes in science. But I have heard that they are targeting May 1st for the return of Bundesliga, which is the German soccer program, uh, the, the professional soccer teams there, in empty stadium. So at least, theoretically, we could have a sport start returning to normalcy and then hopefully you can get maybe into england maybe into spain maybe into italy maybe by the end of the summer and i don't know if if schedule wise they could permit playing those games but i think what's cool about all this is how the environments responded how pollution is down how people have realized all of the things that you follow on Instagram or Facebook are probably not that important. Like, let's be real. Like, it's, it's cool that you follow some girl that tells you about some cool moose that she puts in her hair and she has 2 million followers. But, like, who gives a shit about Kendall Jenner's lipstick? But I was sick on December 29th to March to January 1st. Like, I've never been sick in my life. Couldn't breathe. It was all my chest failed a flu test, failed pneumonia. What else could it have been? Obviously, we didn't know what COVID-19 or coronavirus or whatever you want to call it was back then, but I couldn't even go 10 steps without feeling like I was going to faint and collapse. So having had something that was related to my lungs, I'm not leaving. I, like, this is it. I'm not going anywhere, no matter who tells me. You know, I've, I've screamed and yelled at my mom and dad. I'm sure you have. Um, to, to stay isolated. It sucks. It's tough. Try to make the best out of it, you know? Beyond that, to, to your players that are and to anyone out there that's by themselves, 
they don't have children like you and I have to distract us. They don't have a wife or they don't have um, a roommate or whatnot and they're by themselves. Uh, is there anything that you, any piece of advice you want to give those people? I think that if you're alone or you're isolated, you know, there are a lot of things you can do to not feel alone. Zoom calls, right? I posted on my Twitter, you know, five or six things that I think make people feel less isolated and less, you know, worried and scared. Music has been tremendous for me. Um, you know, you can see the Sonos speakers over my head. I have them all over the place. You know, I listen to music constantly. I try to get like a playlist almost every day of something maybe that I wouldn't normally listen to, you know, cause normally I'll just go to Bob Marley every day and, and that keeps me chill and I'm happy. Um, but you know, working out, walking outside if you can. I mean, I, I will say this for the people that are in the big cities, it's almost impossible, uh, to get outside without running the risk of infection. We, we have one of our staff members who's a huge cyclist and he posted a video on his Instagram, I think on Monday of all of Manhattan. He drove like probably 60 miles around Manhattan and it was an incredible video. And then Tuesday he had 103 fever and he probably has COVID-19, oh, um, but he's, but he's doing okay, but he's doing okay. And so, and that was just him driving alone on his bike around the city. So it's there. And I posted something on Twitter that my mom sent me, which was amazing, which said, if you could see it, if you could see the big red infectious bubbles all over the place, would you go outside? And the answer is no. So I think if you're home and you're isolated, obviously just doing the Netflix and chill all day long is going to drive you insane. Read, educate yourself, free music lessons, language lessons, learn how to cook. I've learned how to make drinks I never knew how to make before, like alcoholic drinks. I love to cook. That's always been a passion of mine, but I'm trying to step it up and take it to another level and do some dishes that would be outside of kind of my norm um, versus my, you know, my 15 or 20 things that I know I can cook really well. Explore the outside world through your computer. You know, go on the computer and read, spend a ton of time learning about this illness and this sickness for yourself. Trust reliable sources. Trust news media that has proven time and time again to give you just the truth, just the facts, and nothing but the facts. But that's my one kind of hope, wish, dream in this thing is that I realize, and you realize because you travel and you have kids and you get to see the world through different eyes, that it's really a small planet. And we're all in this together. Black, white, Jewish, Gentile, Christian, Protestant, Islamic does not matter. Skin color does not matter. Where you're from does not matter. Socioeconomic background does not matter. And what you want to try to do is break through all those barriers and hope that the people of our planet come together now even more so to make this world a better place in whatever small way they can, because it's going to be really hard. David Cantor, everyone. Make sure to stay tuned for our next episode and subscribe to my YouTube channel.